Hello neighbor, I'm Robert Burns and welcome once again to another edition of Sound Off Louisiana and today will actually be episode 12 uh, regarding the Stanford victims uh, and you may recall the jury found by a verdict of 11 to 1 that the OFI was not civilly liable in that matter and uh, the episode before last, i.e. the 10th episode, uh, the plaintiff's attorney Mr. Phil Price indicated that uh, he would likely be seeking a motion for a new trial and he also indicated he may seek a judgment notwithstanding verdict. Now I can just tell you that any judge who would overturn an 11 to 1 jury decision would have raised some eyebrows and I'll let you read into that whatever you may. I'm just telling you that any judge that would have overturned an 11 to 1 ruling by a jury would have raised some eyebrows. So. Uh, Mr. Price did on the 27th of this uh, week, which was Tuesday, he did follow through in, in uh, his indication that he would file a motion for a new trial. We're going to give you a direct link to that. I'm going to give, give you a few of my thoughts on that matter. Uh, and in doing so, I want to read from the bottom of page one of his motion. Now, he filed a 12 page motion a 39-page memorandum, and then a ton of exhibits. Well, at a dollar a page, I felt like I'd, I could certainly justify getting the motion for you, for you to be able to view. I did not feel I could justify $39 to get the memorandum, and I certainly was not going to shell out the money for all of the exhibits. Uh, his cost to file this was, was not just a couple of nickels, but I do want to read from the bottom of the first page. Uh, and it's itemization number six, if you, if you look at the document we're going to provide for you. It's there, it says, quote, the jury determined that OFI was not reckless in not enforcing these policies, jury interrogatory number two. This determination by the jury was in error and ignored the overwhelming written evidence in support of a verdict for the class members. Quote, oral testimony which is in conflict with contemporaneous documents is entitled to little evidentiary weight and then he cites the uh, cases to back up that contention and he said this is especially true when the oral testimony relates to a witness's recollection of events that occurred 20 years ago. Well let me just say this. Mr. Price knew that he had a problem on his hands because of the fact that he had no expert witnesses, not one. If he could have found one that would have been willing to get on that stand and, and, and lay fault at the feet of the OFI, trust me, he would have. The closest he came was Miss Carol Van Tassel. That was originally his witness, okay? His expert witness. But when, they, when it blew up in his face, well, Mr. Blunt was sharp enough to say, you know what, I'm gonna use her. I, I like her testimony. Well, and you may remember that I said Mr. Price sought to have a doe bear hearing basically to block the testimony of both her uh, and Mr. Joseph Borg, the securities expert. He was not entitled to a doe bear hearing. He had not followed the proper procedure for that, which would have been to file the motion a minimum of 60 days before the trial, with a contradictory hearing being held 30 days before the trial. So make no mistake. If, if Mr. Price had anywhere near the expert witness testimony that he wants to say now is, is due, uh, what is it, uh, little evidentiary weight, uh, he would have had them. But he, he knew he had a problem on his hands and, and to try to counteract that, what Mr. Price would do is literally testify himself throughout the trial and then try to have the witness uh, echo his sentiments or agree with his sentiments. Perfect example. And I believe it was John Ducre, the former commissioner who was on the scene, but it possibly may have been Sid Seymour. And Mr. Price asked this question, quote, well, you would have had a, you know, a, a big mess on your hands if you would have shut Stanford down, wouldn't you? Unquote. Well, that is a highly leading question. And look, I want to make, make it clear, the Phelps Dunbar team uh, they did object. I'm just telling you, this judge did not, I think, just like I said before, the word sustained had left his vocabulary. Um, a, a different way of phrasing that question that would have been acceptable 
would have been, can you tell me the implications of you shutting down Stanford? What all would have transpired? That would have been a perfectly legitimate question, but he, he wants to do the testifying, so he says, you would have had a mess on your hands, wouldn't you? I'm going to be blunt, and I, 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 I mean this, I'm not, this is not an exaggeration. It was the worst courtroom performance I've ever seen by any attorney. And I think that is indicative of the fact that he had an exceptionally weak case. Now, he wants to say on here the overwhelming evidence that was introduced. Well, that's his opinion. Okay, I sat through that trial, I saw all of this evidence, and I felt it was very underwhelming. So I don't know where the overwhelming is coming from now. He's talking about things like the memo that John Travis sent out to the banks. So he doesn't want, he doesn't want any of the testimony of Sid Seymour, of John Ducre, uh, and, 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 and others that said that, look, a bank cannot invest in this stuff. The same way they can't invest in Apple, the same way they can't invest in uh, Starbucks. But he, he wants to pretend none of that evidence ever happened, okay? I want you to see my side, my written side, and, and nobody else's. Furthermore, you better see it from my angle. And that's basically what's being said uh, in this motion for a new trial. Uh, he, I mean, he just flat had no expert witness. And I want to say this. Beyond Joe, with a Dobear hearing, had he been able to have one, he made it clear that he wanted to challenge um, using uh, Miss Van Tassel on the part of Mr. Blunt by saying he never retained her. And Mr. Blunt countered and said, there's nothing that requires me to have retained her for her to serve as an expert witness. In fact, the fact that I did not have to write her a check just gives her that much more credibility. So I know it's, it's frustrating for Mr. Price that his own uh, expert witness wound up being a, a source of uh, strength for the defense, but that's the way the cookie crumbles, as my mom used to say many times to me. That's the way the cookie crumbles. Um, and I just, I, I can't emphasize it any more than that. Mr. Price will give his opinion of what this stuff uh, this material constitutes. Now, some people have asked me, well, what is it you would have expected to see that would have caused you to, to see this case differently? And I don't mind answering that question. And first of all, please don't forget that uh, the OFI had fought having these work papers uh, being put out in public. Um, they, Judge Johnson had ruled that it wouldn't have to be put out in public. Uh, and they, uh, OFI, I'm, uh, yeah, OFI appealed to First Circuit, or First Circuit uh, um, sustained the, the lower court's ruling. It wasn't until the Supreme Court that it got determined that these documents would be provided in open court. Quite frankly, I probably would not have covered the trial if, if uh, the Supreme Court had not made the ruling it made. But I can just tell you right now, the OFI opposed that strictly from the vantage point as it was setting precedent because those work papers are supposed to be completely confidential. Uh, they certainly, it's what is obvious to me now, uh, is they were not uh, opposing it because there was any big smoking gun that would be revealed during this trial. But naturally, since they did oppose it, naturally I started to wonder, okay, is there something here that they don't want the public seeing? I mean, that's just a natural tendency. Um, and if, if there had been material in those work papers or in those notations that suggested, hey, this looks like some really bad investment that, uh, you know, maybe a Ponzi scheme, uh, well, that would have been a whole different story. But you didn't have anything remotely close to that. I mean, not even remotely close. So that's what I was kind of figuring maybe was going to be there. I, 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 I kind of felt like it would be hard to believe that it would because I knew many of these people. At least I knew them by name, okay? Uh, when I worked with the FDIC, these, these were common names that we would hear for OFI and that they're good people and, and, and they're very well qualified. So I would have been stunned if there had. Now let me just say one other thing and I'll wrap this video up. Let's just say in an ideal world, because Mr. Price feels strongly that the OFI should have shut Stanford down. Um, 
Well, the more likely scenario, if OFI truly had strong suspicions that a Ponzi scheme was going on here, the more likely scenario is that they would have contacted the regulator who was really responsible for all these type securities, and that, that being the SEC. We now know that if they had done that, the SEC would have said, look, we've been conducting an investigation, just lay low, we, get, we, we got it under control, you know. Um, and, and well, if I surely would not have tried to act then. Um, so, Mr. Price, in my opinion, is really, really uh, grasping at straws here. Uh, I mean, I realize that it's a much less expensive route to go than, than uh, filing an appeal. And uh, he may be able to pull off both. Uh, the clock won't start running until Judge Johnson signs a judgment in terms of the time frame for launching an appeal. It's been my observation uh, that Judge Johnson takes his sweet time in signing judgments. I've, I have, I'm aware of a number of cases where the parties have had to literally call in one case six months went by uh, and say, Judge Johnson, do you intend to sign one of these? Um, he even tells the parties, look, if you hadn't gotten, uh, if we hadn't made a ruling in a week, week and a half, call our office, let's see what fell through the cracks. Um, but there will be a contra well, first of all, there's going to have to be an opposition memorandum filed by uh, OFI, uh, and that opposition memorandum will be due no less than eight days prior to the contradictory hearing for this whole matter. Now, the contradictory hearing, you'll see the order page calling for the contradictory hearing. It's not been filled in yet. Bear in mind, this was only filed on Tuesday. Uh, so it's not been filled in yet with the date and time, but trust me, I will be there to observe that contradictory hearing. Now, I already can tell you what's going to happen because I have sat in Judge Johnson's courtroom so many times and heard this so much that I may, I may as well say, okay, you Your Honor, I can press the play button now. And he can just relax because what's going to come out of his mouth is, okay, I want each side to draft your proposed findings of fact conclusions of law and your judgment from this. You'll need to have that in to me by, and he'll specify time. You can submit it in word format. If you want to go through the, the old fashioned way and file it, you can do that, but you can also submit it to me by word. Uh, and then I will make my determination based on the two. So he, he basically has the attorneys do the work uh, in that regard, and, and, and that's fine. Uh, but what happens in that is one attorney, one attorney is going to be jumping for joy because naturally, uh, you know, if it had, a, 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 a different type hearing would be worded such that, okay, if you want to try to appeal this, what am I going to do? I'm going to have the strongest wording possible. Uh, so one attorney is going to jump for joy. The other attorney is going to be down in the dumps because he, I've never seen him alter anything. Uh, he just picks up a pen and he signs one of the two. So if he happens to deviate from that practice, I'll certainly let you know once I've been to the contradictory hearing. But I'm just telling you, I have sat through hearing after hearing after hearing after hearing in Judge Johnson's courtroom. And I'll say this, his twin brother, Ron Johnson, does the same thing. And I observed that when we, um, it's a totally different matter, but uh, when state police got hit with a temporary restraining order, uh, by Michael Dubos, who is the newest member of the Louisiana State Police Commission. Uh, and when state police went to try to dissolve that, once again, Ron Johnson, that's his twin brother of Don Johnson, said, draft your proposal, your proposed findings of fact, conclusions of law, and your judgment, and I'll sign one. Um, so they have a, they have a little, little technique going there, and I do not expect it to be deviated from. But uh, whatever the case, we will be at the contradictory hearing. We'll also supply the uh, opposition memorandum to this once it is filed into, the, we will update this feature. We will file it into the, um, once it's filed in the court, we'll provide it. And then we will let you know uh, how the contradictory hearing goes. Uh, and then once Judge Johnson makes his ruling on the contradictory hearing, which may not be real fast, um, 
we'll let you know on that as well. Meanwhile, the possibility presumably exists that he, that he being Phil Price, may actually go through a full-blown appeal. It's my opinion that he's grasping at straws and he's costing us as taxpayers more and more money on what, in my opinion, uh, never, never should have remotely gotten this far. That, that thing should have been nipped in the bud long before it was tried and the evidence presented, in my opinion, was unbelievably weak. But as you read Mr. Price's motion for a new trial, He's entitled to his assessment in that regard, and he believes the evidence is, quote, overwhelming. So that'll wrap it up for episode 12 with regard to the Stanford victims. Uh, once again, this is Robert Burns. I am going to take some time off. As everyone knows, Labor Day is coming up on Monday, uh, and I'm going to be visiting with some friends and making a few trips uh, next week. So this, may, this will be the last you'll see of me for a little while. Not that long, but... but uh, you know, it's probably going to be another couple of weeks before I make another feature. So thank you once again for everyone's dedication. I hope you have an enjoyable Labor Day, and we will look to see you next time. Thank you so much.